you're obviously well known for your time at Google and uh, and and for the work you did there you you've been quite heavily involved with products that I would I would say most anyone has used uh including you know the Google Drive ecosystem and and um, you know the apps related to that so I mean uh, maybe just just a general question like what does it feel like to you know <laughs> have left a, quite a big mark on the internet uh, so to say I mean you know just that direct question it feels great I mean I love Literally just last night, my son was here with some friends and they were talking about how they use Google Docs every day, you know, and it's just a it's a great feeling. It really is. And to think that a billion people every month use some of the products that I helped create is just exciting. And, you know, but I'm also aware that um, that was then, you know, there's there's new products coming out. And sometimes I uh, I really want to be part of. Uh, what's going on in some of the new products. So even in, in, you know, on the side, I love to invest in products that I believe will displace Google Docs at some point, or at least add to it. You know, I think it takes so long. What What's happened, I think, with Docs and Drive and Sheets is those have a really strong root system. People are using them now as what they use every day. I'm habitual. I, I, I wouldn't use something else only. I would, you know, keep using Google Docs even if I take on something new. Um, which is the same thing that happened with Office. You know, Office is is deep rooted, but there's plenty of room for innovation. You know, so a product like Coda, I love Coda, and and it's just like it's got so many of the features that I wish I did in, in Google Docs, um, and you can only do so much. So there's always going to be new products, but um, but it does feel great. It was it was an amazing experience. I was there for 14 years at Google, and the first eight were literally growing Google Docs, Sheets, Slides, starting with Sheets. Uh, drive and, and forums and a bunch of others. Um, you know, the first eight years was was all that growing it from a team of four, uh, four people to uh, to many several hundred, and so it was uh, that was amazing. And then um, and then I moved on to education and worked on uh, and introduced some new products there, Google Classroom and others, which again with the pandemic proved to be incredibly valuable to people, which which feels great. Yeah, how do you approach building something new? I mean, with the Google Drive ecosystem, that was basically okay. With the, in the case of Docs, taking something that existed and, and then making it online, but you know, doing educational product or looking at what Sapir has done. How do you, you know, go about creating something that's that's new or a modification on something existing already? I mean, I think the key is to find a problem that needs solving. And one of the misnomers about when we started Google Sheets, it was it was literally Sheets. That was the first thing we'd worked on. People thought we were just trying to compete with Excel. And, and it sounded crazy. And I would have even said, why? Excel's not broken. There is no problem to solve there. Like, I think that's how people looked at it was, what, what problem are you solving if you're just creating, you know, just putting it online? And sure, you, you can kill the save button and make it a share button. And that's great. But what we found was actually the problem we were solving was sharing, was collaboration and teamwork. And that was really broken in office in the old days. I think it was something that, you know, everybody experienced, but they never expressed. And so we found this insight uh, while working on the product at Google that real-time collaboration uh, was was going to fix that. It was going to be one of the key um uh, solutions to the problem of sharing. And and that turned out to be true. It, it took a long time for people to really uh, discover it. Um, there's epic stories of people not even realizing when they were using docs that they could be in the document at the same time as somebody else until years later when somebody finally joins and they see them there and it's like, oh my God, I can see somebody else in my document. There's really some epic stories around that at Google. Um, but it's, um, I think the key is to find a problem and solve it in the simplest way possible and not not let your uh, desire for expansion come too soon. And so we started with Sheets and real-time collaboration. We barely had any of the features that Excel had, but we had enough and we had some of the key things that would let people share spreadsheets. And then we moved on to Docs and did something very simple and moved on to Slides and did something very simple. Um, and the other thing we did, I think that's a key that I talk about a lot. I think I talked about it at my presentation at Slush last year, which was the idea of building a bridge for people 
and giving them something familiar enough so it's they're not making a hundred percent shift. They're not turning ninety degrees to the left or one hundred and eighty degrees to to use something new. Make it easy for them by building a bridge. So for us, the bridge was the split between spreadsheets, documents, and presentations. That is not necessarily a natural split. And But back then, it was hard to challenge that because people then didn't know when to use this thing. So we made it very uh, understandable and familiar in that way, but then introduced real-time collaboration. And now a product like Coda could actually challenge that and say, no, no, it's just a document that has anything in it. It's got active add-ons and what they call packs and things that are functional inside the document. And it's got multiple pages, multiple chapters. It's, you know, things that we weren't comfortable challenging back then, but now you can. When you go about building something that's this big and, and has such a big user base and then put on top of that the the resistance of the legacy of there's nothing wrong with this, how do you make sure that you don't mess up along the way? And that the whole project doesn't collapse because of a some sort of yeah rock on the way. Yeah, you know it's hard, and I th- that's where I think that building a bridge is key. But you also have to really be honest about the feedback of you know in the product with with your customers. That that's when listening to the customers takes over. To say, are people loving this product? If you took it away, will they be upset? And that is the you know ultimate um, metric. Of, of whether the product can, can exist on its own and, and whether you're on a right path. There's, there's no the right path. There's not one right path. And that's what's so hard about product management generally is there's so many ways to go about it. Um, and there's so many examples of that at Zapier too. There's so many directions you could take that product. And the founders and then I and others that, that lead that team have been able to forge a path that really worked by listening to customers and to really let the customers guide um, the success, not uh, not just a desire to make more money or desire, you know, to to just win, you know, crazy amounts of customers in one shot. You know, it's really just a, a, a somewhat moderately paced march uh, towards something that's successful. So I think I think the key is to start listening to customers as early as possible and be super honest about what you're hearing. You know, don't don't let your own either ego or uh, pursuit, you know, what you believe is the right thing as an individual, because that's how great products start. Usually as an individual believes, oh, my God, I really think I have a great idea here. But soon you have to turn that over to your customers and say, do they think it's a great idea? Are they loving this product? Will they be upset if I turn it off? 